Um, so today, um, mobile continues delivering. Uh, the background is that after retiring from all the DevOps days, I thought about a new challenge and I joined a startup. And what the startup does, we make apps for TV shows. So not only the app, but we're also in the studio displaying the results and the, the show actually, the course of the show actually changes based on our input of the show. And then the people uh, of the show themselves can kind of also override whatever the voters are doing or the people are doing. So this is kind of the setting I'm working in. So it's the app that has to work that one hour of the show. So how faster, how better, how more reliable we can do things, that's our focus. And I think it will help whatever your app is in general. What does this have to do with DevOps? Um, uh, after a couple of years in the whole DevOps, I, I kind of figured this mental model for myself that typically DevOps, you know, you can run, improve yourself in Dev and Ops themselves, but typically in a company, the first thing you do is extend your delivery to production. Everything with the CI and a pipeline and the delivery, uh, that's usually the most practical place where DevOps starts and the collaboration starts between the groups. Once you have the app to production and you're like improving that part, um, typically the next phase kicks in is how can we get all the information from the running app back to the people from the projects? Logs, metrics, all the self-servicing, uh, so we can give them feedback to the project. Uh, initially, this typically starts as the two more technical phases um, of the uh, introduction of DevOps. And then the third is more like, can we embed the knowledge? So not just the app, but everything we learned about what this app has to do, the functionality, the user, uh, uh, the, the project owner has asked, and so on. Can we put that knowledge into operations so they know which function is the most important, if there's a failure, if they have to make choices, so they actually have an insight more into the business. And then once this knowledge gets transferred to the operations, and you're running it, it's getting all the insights like analytics, what are the users doing, like why they're doing, so you can actually improve what projects need to be doing. So for me, this is the mental model for areas of DevOps. And so when I went into the mobile space, I said, okay, let's try to work on each of these areas and see uh, uh, what we need to improve. Um, to be honest, my first thing was, how hard can it be? How different can it be from websites? But it felt a little bit like entering the circus, I'm afraid. So the first thing, if you do mobile app development uh, for uh, anything on iOS, you need a Mac. And typically in your CI pipeline, there are no Macs. Uh, so, you know, you look around and of, Luckily, the people from Travis CI and Circle CI, they're now able to run OS X builds, so you can just, you don't have to hassle with having your old uh, Mac mini farm and so on. So, you know, it, you know, typically it starts like that, like, let's put it on a Mac mini, but you don't want to worry about all that stuff because we didn't want to worry about all the other stuff anyway, so. Then, you know, you continue to say, okay, I need the Android toolkit, I need the Xcode toolkit to be installed. It's a little bit tricky, but it can be automated. I'll leave it like that, but you know, even that, you can automate. With iOS, um, yeah, Apple is funny. Um, they make you jump through hoops with certificates and code signing and so on. It feels a bit like puppet and certs, but, that on a side note. Um, so you actually have to like put every of these keys on your CI build system, import them into the key store, and make sure that the key store doesn't close after uh, a, a certain number of um, uh, seconds. So you have to disable the timeouts and all that stuff. But you know this snippet will get you going uh, if you do that. But it's something you don't expect for a build that you have to kind of have to worry about all that stuff. And of course, there's no escaping dependency hell, where it's Cocoa Pots or Maven or Gradle, you know, it's still the same old song, vendor, your dependencies, lock down your versions, so that's not really new. Uh, so I thought I was like 
um, done with Maven, and it came back into my life like this, but that happens. Um, the way we build our software is that we make multiple builds for multiple environments. Why do we do that? Is that this allows us to install all the different versions on our devices, and it's not one app. So we can have testing for the multiple versions that are upcoming, the ones in the App Store, the ones about to be approved in the App Store, the one on, that's supposed to be going to production, and the one on staging, and maybe integration and so on. So we give them visual cues, so it's easy for you know, end user to be able to do that. And then each of these apps have their own settings in the build. So the code is the same, but the build settings are different, so they use different API endpoints, which are similar, but during the compilation and the build of the, the binary of the app, we change these settings on our build server based on the environment. So we don't put them in the app itself. It's kind of like a, a compiler flag you have to think of uh, as a way uh, they uh, get integrated. And then, of course, you want to have a readable build. Took a while to get that into. Uh, mobile development, but now we can have like the unit test and the nice things and the output is very readable and it's not just like one compiled Objective-C command showing an output and then you have to guess where you forgot the comma or something, so. And because it's code, you can do things like static analysis uh, that allows you to kind of uh, find another set of uh, problems. Uh, there's a Facebook tool, Infer, uh, that was really um, released that allows you to kind of do that and then you find like missing memory leaks and stuff like that that you typically with your Node.js or Ruby and so on you stopped worrying about it but now you're back at worrying about that stuff. And then for mobile security I'm not saying this is the global security check what most of these tools do is they look at your dependencies whether you're up to date with the versions of the things you're building um, I haven't come across a more in-depth tool. Of course, you can do fuzzing and that stuff, but not something that I, I haven't found, like a tool that really uh, like does vendor attacks in, as a, that easily uh, is integratable in our CI system. So now we got the build with the different system, uh, uh, settings for the different environments. And then you think, okay, I have this binary, I'll send it out to somebody to you know, test it. Guess what? Apple made another hoop, and you can distribute the build, but the build you have to say for which device and which, uh, not user, but which device is allowed to run your build. So the next thing you have to do is you have to hassle all your users and ask like, hey, open your Mac, Add, uh, insert your device, tell us the UDID, and then you add that to the list of devices that's allowed to run your test builds. I'm not talking about the App Store builds, that's a different mechanism, but for the uh, actual test builds or ad hoc builds, you have to manage that system and so on. There's a way around it with an enterprise version of, but you, know, you have to pay extra, and one of the things is you can only be in one enterprise um, uh, account on Apple, so again, another set of hoops, but you know, this kind of gets you around. Uh, like I told, you can automate that and list and add uh, things to uh, uh, thing. It's basically like, almost like screen scraping the APIs. There's no official Apple API, so all these tools are kind of like, hey, we'll build something on that and see if that keeps working. Uh, from time to time, they change things, like they put a little flag that you have to say, okay, I agree with the terms, and then the tools have to refresh themselves to make that happen. But, so this is kind of the sorry state of tools uh, in the space, I'm, I'm afraid. So the end user actually has to install one app, which is the beta test app or a similar thing, and then it lists all the apps the user has access to. So you can update the new version, it can switch to a previous version, uh, and uh, easily work from there. So once you get the enlistment of the devices and the users, uh, this is pretty uh, straightforward. Also, when you start the app, it will say there's a new version available, do you want to update? So that's kind of uh, neat uh, to get that working. So for us, this was super important. We didn't start with writing tests in our code. For us, the most important thing was to get it to the users or the people who have to think about the concept of the app. Because 
for us, it's a creative app, so the concept can change a lot. So we typically defer writing tests until that concept settles down, but it's more important to see, will the concept work? Is it something uh, funny? Will it work? And so we, the prototypes are distributed that way as well. So we, from we, the first commit we do is goes out to the users. I mean the test users or the people who have to decide on the functionality. And then to make it easy to give them feedback, uh, we add a, a little thing like you, ch you just shake your device, comes up a feedback form, you type in, okay, well, what did you like, what didn't you like, and you get the feedback. Immediately, we also get the version they were using and stuff like that. And we, we ha uh, it did happen that a customer didn't have any device. So you're able to use your simulator builds and upload it to a tool like appetize.io so the user can actually do it in a browser. Uh, sometimes pretty nice because you know, then you don't have to do the dance of, of the users register their devices and you can kind of easily distribute your app to a broader audience. And then you can take it one step further. Um, it's record the session while they're doing it. So you can actually see they clicked on that button, CPU, memory network, all that stuff during uh, your session. So if he says, I have a problem, I hit this, and then he has a hard time describing it, just look at the session and we'll, we'll know what you've done. So super important for us, getting the feedback and then understanding when he says he has a problem, what happened. Like I said, we don't do a lot of testing initially, but we do scenario testing. So we have less of unit tests in the code, but more like run through of the scenarios. Uh, this could be a whole uh, topic for a talk. Uh, briefly, the idea is there's a few frameworks. Think about Selenium-like tests or the drivers to drive your uh, mobile apps uh, from remote. And the trick there is that it works on accessibility labels. So if you put accessibility labels on uh, uh, objects in your, uh, not your DOM, but your UI structure, you can easily address and say, click this button and then do this. Instead of saying, it's the third text field from the UI to the left and, and so on. So we typically just add immediately uh, the accessibility labels and by making them the same on Android and on iOS, we can typically rerun the same scenarios on both devices. There is a whole game there of subtle differences between devices, but uh, again, that's for another talk. So once we have these uh, scenario testing, we typically run them into simulators on our desktop. Uh, we use uh, Jenny Motion for Android, which allows us to use, uh, which is behind the scene has VirtualBox, and it uses hardware acceleration, so it's much faster than the typical Android uh, device simulators. Um, and it allows you also very easily to have multiple uh, screen sizes, multiple OS versions from Android, so you can get like a test from that. And you know, people are taking that further, especially for uh, the Android thing. You can just run your device in a virtual box. Uh, whether it's some people have experiment using Vagrant or running Docker for running their Android tests uh, because you know spinning it up and a new version switching to different uh, uh, Android versions makes that easy. Uh, there's no equivalent for Docker unfortunately for OS 6 or um, iOS, but people have made like an API interface that is the a Docker API allows you to start up the simulators in a similar way on a Mac machine. So. so we got our scenarios, we tested them in the simulator, and then for us, uh, because we go to immediately to a broad audience, we wanna test on like uh, one of the final, uh, we're not doing this con uh, continuously, but when we actually submit to the app store or the final submit goes there, we do a sweep across uh, uh, real devices. Um, why is that necessary, you think, about, because you have all the simulators? Um, simple example, somebody at Samsung thought it was a good idea to, to change a few classes 
of the uh, Android operating system and put them before uh, in the class loader. Uh, so you wouldn't see that in a simulator, but on the device itself, it would just not work. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, I think Amazon recently bought uh, AppTwack, uh, but there's many out there. You can just say, run these scenarios that I created, I validate in my simulator, run this on this set of real devices. Super helpful, um, not only for making sure that the scenario works, but our visual designer can actually see whether the design works on smaller screen, larger screens, all the DPI settings, and he just gets the, the visual cues like, hey, does this look okay on all these different uh, devices on Android? So not just for functional testing, but also for uh, watching that the, the visualization actually is correct. And then sometimes we hit a problem with one of those devices. Um, and uh, we haven't, like we, we've beta tested it, but uh, we're not using it yet uh, continuously, is that you can do, um, with the device farms, you can submit your test and it runs and it's done. But sometimes you need exploratory testing because you, it, it's hard to write the test and you just want to say, okay, give me that device. And these solutions allow you to kind of have like a remote display on a real device that you can click and see what's happening and so on. So it's kind of exploratory testing uh, in that way. Uh, and you don't have to own that device. I'm not saying this cheap. Uh, it's actually more expensive than servers. Uh, running those devices, and typically for running it for a month, you might be able to buy the device. But you know, making the hassle of keeping up to date with all the OS versions, all the, that stuff, you know, it makes it worth to kind of spend some money uh, on these uh, device farms. Um, the difference, for example, between Amazon and the others is that Amazon uh, uses a per minute billing. And the nice thing for us is that it goes out to the same credit card and we just label it like an extra cost in the bill and it just goes out. So that was really nice for us. Okay, everything tested, but um, the next part that we do is we try to see what's happening over the wire. So um, a lot of frameworks are used to like download uh, or do HTTP requests and then cache it. But sometimes we don't really know uh, what this actually is doing. Um, in the beginning, we used to do sniffing and see the URLs passing. Luckily, there are now a few tools that allow you to use uh, Chrome developer tools and hook them up into your mobile app. And then you can just use, see the timings and whatever happens. So even the local storage of the uh, mobile device you can connect to and see what's happening. So this kind of gives you the same uh, level of tooling as you would be used uh, of doing a website. And then, uh, not immediately integrated, but uh, on the device farms, you can often also select, like, uh, do you want to test it on 3G, on a LAN speed, and so on. So you can select that. We use that for, uh, or when we use the simulator, we use Charles Proxy to kind of see how the app behaves uh, on slower speeds or packet loss or that. We do that exploratory, so it's not integrated, but it's one of the things that we do check before we go live. And of course, you final step is we built this all, it all approved, and so on. You publish it to the Play Store, which is, you know, again, simple Gradle, task, execute, do it in the Play Store. Um, on iOS, this used to be really hard because, again, the API was not known. Um, one guy wrote a, about three, four months a whole tool set of iOS tools that finally work together, and then he got bought by Twitter. Uh, it might not be very known, but Twitter is actually, uh, besides having the Twitter SDK, they have a lot of dev tools, and it seems they're like ramping up in the space. They have a free crash reporting tool, they have a free analytics tool, they have a pre onboarding tool, and so with them buying this suite, you know, it seems they're like seriously, and I, at a certain time, I expect like a spin off, like, hey, this is the mobile tooling company or something. So, delivery, we went to the App Store and on. 
I'm sorry it's a lot of tools, uh, but that's the sorry state, like I said before. Um, and it took me a while to find all those tools and to piece them together. But luckily, you can just read the deck and, and, and find the tools. They're also very fast evolving uh, because it's, it seems to be like experimental. And every day, there's a new tool that comes out, uh, which is a good thing and a bad thing because you have to spend time with it. So we're going live. Um, metrics, <laughs> who expected something else? Um, so we, obviously, when the app goes live, uh, on the back end, you have all your metrics, you follow up your, your users, and so on. But one of the things that you also want to monitor is that the app metrics, how many downloads? So if you go to the App Store, their stats are two days old. So imagine going live for a TV show and waiting for two days to know how many users downloaded the app. You don't want to do that. So this tool, Fabric, owned by Twitter, you can see it in real time. You can see the crash reports in real time. We do follow also Google Analytics because they have uh, more on the location and widespread and the reporting. Um, the Fabric tool is really hard. They also, they don't have good APIs for getting data out of it, so you can watch the dashboard. But now uh, Amazon also has like mobile analytics, and that allows us you know, to also store it over there. And then we can just uh, archive it in S3 so we have all the logs of all the users, what they did there as well. So app metrics. And then you want to track the network errors. So um, it's not just on the back end. You will not see that the client are experiencing errors. So we use a new Relic plugin that allows us to, that actually checks each HTTP request going from the app device itself, and that tracks the errors. In that way, we can see that sometimes in the morning in Belgium, Facebook is down, and we wouldn't know it. But we, we know that because we can see it from the user perspective. We can see that our ads network is down. We can see that our login provider is down, stuff we normally cannot see from the back end. Uh, we can see um, other things like uh, memory consumption, but for now, we only use that during the tests. So it's a plugin in your app that sends all the metrics to New Relic, and you can see the memory usage uh, and CPU usage uh, from the app itself. So it's just thinking, like, if you come from the back end, what can I measure, what can I do on the uh, device itself? And apparently, you can do a lot. I talked about the crashes. Uh, those two typically run a little bit behind on the Play Store or the App Store. Um, so we use uh, another tool from Fabric as well uh, that allows us to have instant uh, tooling on whatever crash that happens. So we can see which device, the power state, the operating system, the memory the user had, all that stuff when the crash uh, um, occurs. And it gives you like a, a stack trace exception of what happened at that moment. Uh, super useful if it's real time and you know, closing a bug. Uh, it's kind of like a ticketing system. There are bugs that you don't want to solve or you, you wouldn't know how to solve. Uh, so typically there's like 20, 40 that you just don't understand why they're crashing in a weird state in iOS or Android. But if it's very frequent, you know which ones to look for. Um, in the crash reports, we also integrate like what user that was. So when the crash gets sent, we can relate that to which user had an issue. And um, because we uh, not only send the metrics from our app and our device, we also send the logs from the device to our log system. Then we can correlate, hey, this user had a problem. This is what he did in the app, because we log what he does in the app. This is what he did from the API perspective. And we can just follow the trace and see what happened and what was the issue. Uh, for example, one of the things we would log from the app device, if it has low memory, uh, because then the user says, oh, it, it's acting weird. Yeah, of course, but you don't have enough memory. Restart the app, and so on. This it was kind of new for most developers I worked with. Like, Why do we need to integrate all this stuff? 
I say, I want to know what happened. It's not just a black box. If a user has a problem, I want to be able to understand and not having to ask the user what he did. Um, so simple search by email address will give me everything he did. So I can track user scenarios uh, or like sessions what he did. So the biggest hurdle there was to convince them that logging is not just debug and non-debug. It's level 50 fatal, level 40 warning, 30 info, and so on. So for them, it, got, uh, it required to get used to that they were not just doing debug or non-debug. And we even have a way of remotely enabling when a user has an issue and we have the user ID, email address, and so on, we kind of have a feature flag that allows us to remotely increase the logging for that user. Uh, and when uh, the user starts the app, we have it sent the iOS logs of everything it did uh, also to us, not just what our app or our API did, but maybe other frameworks, we can increase uh, the uh, debug level as well. Same on Android. And when we go live, the other thing is, especially with TV shows, is just to watch on Twitter. So hopefully then we can relate that username with something in our logs and we can find, hey, what was he doing? And we just start replying on Twitter or wherever. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is that he actually goes to the app store and says it's a bad app. So you totally want to avoid this. Why? Because in the Play Store, you're uh, luckily you can reply, but you lost all context of that user. At what time did you have an issue? Like, what was the state and so on? Uh, so it's really annoying. But the ratings are useful still. And of course, we integrated that and we get that in our Slack channel when somebody puts something as an error or an issue. Uh, so it's like part of our Slack channel uh, of information that comes back. But what we really learned is that we want to capture the feedback in the app itself. Because then we can have all the context. Of the moment he sent, uh, it pushes sent or whatever, we can see what's the state of the app, like what's being using, like what's the ID of the user. And we send everything with that request so we can kind of correlate that for support. Uh, so uh, it just creates a ticket in our system. Uh, and then we can start replying. We, we can even live chat with the user. So we, we've moved them away from the App Store and we just gave them a way to give feedback and we can see what OS is he using, like what, what's the last thing he did, like the logs that he got. So it's a lot better way to give uh, support. And then when we have um, solved the issue, oh, okay, so that, this is like an example of the live chat and it really works. Like uh, the apps that we launched it for uh, got better ratings uh, because they uh, stayed in the app to give the feedback. And once, um, I guess, once we got the feedback, we have a way to triggering them to do a review in the App Store. So when they're happy, then we redirect them to the App Store. <laughs> um, a little side note on like re reviews and ratings in the App Store. Those stats get reset every time you push out a new version. So the more versions you push out, the more chances you have to get the ratings better. It's like a simple side effect. You don't want to push every day. That's another story. Um, but we also want to notify the user in the app. Seems something trivial, but you know, you learn by hard way, hey shit, something's down, and we have no way of communicating it with the app. So typically we have like a maintenance message, the apps re uh, read it and then display it in the app. If not, like you get like a lot of requests or people angry and so on. So it's just giving feedback. And then whenever we hit a problem, we put it in a frequent ask question. So at least they can read and we can update that live. Um, so we try to prevent new uh, questions about that. Another problem we are facing is that the version drift. Uh, there's no consistent way to have people upgrade the app. So we build it into the app a way to check what's your current version and we show the user uh, a display dialog uh, to do that. Why is that important? With the web, that's kind of easy. I'm not talking about browser different versions, but the app version is typically the one that's live, unless you're doing A-B testing and blah, blah, blah. But 
This is more like, hey, uh, especially on newer features, you want to push them to update. And lots of people have auto update on, but some not. And then you end up spending time for all those tickets uh, there and say, OK, you need to upgrade, you need to upgrade. We haven't used this one, but apparently this solution just allows you to share your screen uh, for support. So it's not just typing in the chat, but you know, just do what you have an issue with. We'll, we'll look at it. Uh, that seems pretty interesting. So what gives that? On the left side, uh, this is uh, just a part of our Slack channel from everything on the server, Chef Run, you know, GitHub, blah, 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 build server. And on the right, you know, the logs, the crashes, uh, and uh, other stuff from the App Store reviews. So it's actually the same channel, so you get all the feedback in that. Uh, initially, there will be a lot of crashes, and then the team says, oh, can't we shut this off? No, no, just fix it. Just, and then it goes away. Uh, so it's one way to kind of be annoying, but still for a good cause. So you've now reached the point of, you know, we extended the operations feedback back to the project, the issues, technical, and stuff, and so on. Okay. The most annoying part, if you're like anywhere used in DevOps, is App Store approval. Uh, on average, seven days. Um, I recently had something that, like, I had a really urgent bug that needed to be fixed. You know, I talked about the version thing that checks the version. That library had an issue. So the user, there was a new app, the old one crashed. So all the old one crashed because that library had an issue. And if we were to fix it, only the next version would fix it. So they would have that again on the next upgrade. And because it's in the beginning of the app, we couldn't do anything about it. So we thought, this seems like an urgent bug fix. So we made an expedite to Apple. One day later, we got a response saying, we will look into the problem. One day later, we, they approved our fix. So just gives you an idea like, hey, uh, this is not really helpful. So we just try to go around. Whenever we don't have to do uh, App Store submit, we try to do that. Uh, this is an other app we built for a, a kids uh, channel. And um, part of it is uh, native. Uh, for example, this is a, a drawing app where kids can send drawings to television and they're displayed during the show. Uh, this is just watching movies. This is a game. But the game is made in HTML. And we can plug in the game and update the game without an issue, uh, without having to go to the App Store. The same thing for uh, the memory game and the surprise button. So if we don't really need any native stuff, we'll kind of try to switch to HTML views that we can kind of remotely update. We do support always a good part of the functionality uh, without the update, or that has to be native. So we're not just saying HTTP URL somewhere remote and this is our app. Uh, but this allows us uh, a way to, one, um, uh, hit the deadlines that we have to do. Because whatever we can push into a website, we can still have seven days to build before go live. OK. Uh, initially, we built the apps and just put them into the App Store. So the first thing we did, like, hey, OK, I want to do remote config. So uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, all the settings I want to be able to change remotely. Uh, so the app starts up, read a remote JSON P list, whatever, and then reads the settings and then reconfigures the app. Has been really helpful. The next thing is, Anything that's localization or strings or whatever, move it out. You want to have something in, but you want to have like a synchronized way to update the strings. Not because you had a typo error and you want to go to the App Store, resubmit. No. So anything of strings and whatever, we try to put out. All the imagery and so on, they have a local one built into the app, but they can be overrided remotely. So if we if they don't like the color of the button, 
or they don't like the, the, the image, we are able to do that remotely. Um, this is a side note, but if you're doing all this HTML app stuff, um, Android is, has, uh, what's it called, a navigator, which is kind of a web browser, uh, and they have uh, a whole lot of versions. So we typically uh, package Chrome within our app so that we get a, at least a compatibility layer that we don't have to worry about all the different flavors and versions uh, of the HTML. And then we started creating a bridge between uh, HTML and the native. So we can send events to, from each of the native apps and the HTML apps, and they can trigger events uh, uh, between each other. So this allows us to, for example, build into the HTML uh, app a close, that it actually closes the web view and then starts something else into the app. So it's kind of a signaling uh, mess, uh, way. So we build a native app, we have HTML web views, but we also have PhoneGap integrated, so we can also use native functions uh, in the app by remotely updating the HTML, and then we can still access native functionality over the Cordova phone gap thing. And then for the assets, we can we create remote bundles that get updated at reboot or start of the app and, and get new assets in. And then, very nice feature, and I wish I had it while solving that version bug, uh, is something called uh, rollout or live patching. And what it actually uses on iOS is a technique called swizzling. So it looks, so it's a plugin you just you know, enable in your app. It looks at all the function that your apps has, so just the native functions, and it creates wrapper functions around it. And remotely, you can say, you know, the return value of this function is true, false, always 10, I don't care. So you can just bypass functions or override things without having to resubmit. Uh, it's more meant as a patch and not like a full update something, but at least it, it's, uh, it seems very helpful. And it's allowed by Apple, so uh, we don't change code, we just change the execution path. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so we kind of embedded that um, information uh, of the project into operations. I guess the next thing is that we look at user interactions for the business. So the, the click stream of whatever view they clicked, um, the user recordings of the, like where did they click something, uh, but that starts to be more like a typical HTML apps and so on uh, that you wanna record. Uh, so you can record the whole session one by one for a user, for example, to learn more and then you, you start having the typical tools like uh, Google Analytics or whatever you use. Uh, you also watch the ranking of your app, um, the retention time, uh, and you wanna do A-B testing. But because everything is now in place, you can now use whatever tools that you have uh, to do uh, all the business related stuff. Uh, okay. And then you also wanna keep them engaged. So uh, typically you wanna send push notifications, emails, all stuff like that, in-app notifications uh, to engage users to come back to your app to, or to announce a new feature and so on. We're still exploring that phase, but to be honest, so I think uh, there's good work to be done there. Uh, so in a nutshell, we kind of are now to the business and we can give them the feedback that they need to decide on new features, what the users want, what the users like or not. So for me, it's kind of felt like if you have so much fun creating a mobile delivery app uh, pipeline, so what's about Internet of Things? So I'll leave it here and maybe next year I'll come talk about that. That's it, that's my talk. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe for remote logging? Yes. We use uh, uh, log entries, uh, but uh, it could be any system. So 
Uh, we typically catch the error log, uh, errors in the app. We convert them to a JSON format that has the user identifier and so on. And what the, these plugins do is just send it over an HTTP with a key to a log system. We, yeah. yeah. We use log entries. Yes, but you can use Logly. All these uh, like log services they typically now have like a mobile logging or uh, an HTML web logging tool that uh, like uh, gets into the same place as your logs. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you mean uh, third-party libraries or third-party services? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most of the services we use remote are for, uh, you know, uh, I think, like logging and metrics and so on. They're asynchronously, so they're not like uh, they're only done when the CPU has time and so on. But like authentication services and ad services, uh, there's not a lot we can do about it. Sometimes we just disable it if it doesn't work or it gets too slow. Uh, but you know that's why we monitor these like remote HTTP calls to uh, these third-party services. Uh, and for third-party libraries, yeah, it's it's a lot of reading the change log uh, and like locking versions and make sure that the tested one is the same that you're going to put in production and so on. So I don't think that's very different from uh, generic app uh, development. Okay. Any more questions? We all want to go to lunch. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, there is an even more elaborated slide deck online with even more tools and more <laughs> suggestions, but like I cut a little bit down. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs>